Welcome to the Cosmic Eye Show, where we explore spiritual ideas and books that help you live a better life. Hosted by spiritual teacher and author of If You Can Worry, You Can Meditate, Jason Napolitano. Hello, welcome to the Cosmic Eye Show. I am your host, Jason Napolitano, and I have on the line my intrepid co-host, Mr. Chris Sheridan. How you doing, Chris? Doing great, Jason. Looking forward awesome. to this one. Yeah. Exactly. This is going to be a fun one. We're talking about Isis, Virgin of the World. It is chapter eight, uh, chapter eight, Roman numeral eight in the big book of Secret Teachings, Manly P. Hall's classic work. And we're going to get into the symbolism of Isis, alchemical and hermetic symbolism of Isis, a little bit about her story and more fun stuff. Uh, we, of course, are here each Sunday uh, talking about uh, the ancient wisdom, psychology, occult subject matter, ancient mysteries and technologies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we encourage you to send your questions or your comments in. Uh, you can reach us at info at cosmiceye.org. Uh, check us out at cosmiceye.org or at Chris's website, chrissheridan.com. Uh, I'm the author of If You Can Worry, You Can Meditate. Chris is the author of The Spirit in the Sky. And like I said, we're here each week. We appreciate your support. Also on Anchor FM, you can go to anchor.fm slash cosmic eye and you can support, uh, you can support the podcast and the, the new video uh, cast of this that we're doing. I don't know what do you call that, a vlog? What are the kids calling it these days? So, <laughs> video podcast, I don't know. <laughs> podcast, what have you. It is actually nice uh, to do this one with the video because much of this chapter is dedicated to an exposition of uh, the Saidic Isis, which is a particular image of Isis, which was found in Saïs in Egypt. And there's a beautiful uh, Nap image. Uh, Nap was the artist who did the, uh, all the wonderful illustrations and secret teachings, the color ones. And with that, we're going to jump right into Isis, Virgin of the World. All right, so I want to read uh, the quote, the beginning of this chapter, because I think it really sets it up well. Uh, it is especially fitting that a study of Hermetic symbolism should begin with a discussion of the symbols and attributes of the Saidic Isis. This is the Isis of Saïs, famous for the inscription concerning her, which appeared on the front of her temple in that city and reads as follows, I, Isis, am all that has been, that is or shall be. No mortal man hath ever me unveiled hath ever me unveiled. So this is the virgin Isis, the Isis of the world. Another uh, symbolism um, of that would be uh, the great mother, the great mother archetype, mother nature, the womb of creation, as it were. All right, so when we understand that, we can kind of see where we're headed, speaking a little bit more about Isis, uh, uh, the virgin of the world. So Saïs, as I said, is a city in Egypt uh, where, where this, where the statue was found. Uh, this actually comes, this inscription in the statue were, were, were seen and commented on by Plutarch, who was a Greek writer, uh, late first century, early second century. Uh, Greek writer of importance, a biographer and an essayist uh, in ancient Greece. So we know uh, much of this information comes from, from the Greeks. This of course is a time when there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, cultural sort of borrowing and a lot of um, intermingling, obviously, in Egypt and Greece, the time of Alexandria and so forth. So Greek culture is infused into Egypt and Egyptian culture is fused into the Greek culture. All right, so what is this veiled statue of Isis? The veil, as we said, uh, is a symbol, of, I didn't say this, but uh, the veil is a symbol of the mysteries symbol of virginity. That's where they get, where we're getting uh, Manly Hall's title, virgin of the world. Uh, so essentially the symbolism that's at work is very similar to the idea of the Virgin Mary. Uh, and they're, they're definitely connected symbolically. All right. So. And with hermeticism, start, uh, that, you know, this Isis is very much linked to the hermetic tradition and um, symbolism. It's also that sealed nature of the mysteries, the veil that keeps the profane from the sacred. That's a great point. And it's that idea too, not so much that it's a secret uh, that's, that's being purposefully kept from anyone, but 
although that was the case in, in some cases with the information, but it's, it's a, a secret that can only be known uh, internally and only through a certain attitude and a certain type of, um, should we say, uh, esoteric work that occurs within one that allows that to unfold. Would you agree with that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the, true, the true veil is, is the one that we have. We have our own blinders. We have our own shield that keeps us from truth. And that's generally our own ignorance or our own stubbornness or our reliance on ego and material matters. Uh, that becomes our own barrier. Not that something is being kept from us. We're kind of keeping ourselves from this, uh, not because we're not prepared. Uh, so the really odd uh, thing of the veil is, is our own ignorance uh, that is keeping us from seeing the truth. Definitely. And that's, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but that is one of the, that ignorance and that sort of egotism in, and, and that kind of um, sort of symbolism goes along with uh, Isis's brother, Seth. Um, and that is, that is one of his, his sort of attributes. And I think the, uh, the story that we'll get into, you'll, you'll see how that works into it. So, let me uh, share another Manly Hall quote. Um, he's speaking on ISIS here. And uh, this kind of is a nice summary uh, of this, this, whole, uh, this whole symbolic nature of ISIS. He says, this Egyptian deity, under many names, appears as the principle of natural fecundity, uh, fecundity being uh, the generative quality uh, of the earth, among nearly all the religions of the ancient world. She was known as the goddess with 10,000 appellations, that's uh, names, and was uh, metamorphosed, metamorphosed, am I saying that right? I think so. Metamorphosed by Christianity into, virgin, into the Virgin Mary. For Isis, although she gave birth to all living things, chief among them the sun, still remained a virgin according to the legendary accounts. So what you're seeing here is a symbol of of, of really the matrix upon which all life comes from. It's, it's, it's nature, it's more than nature though, it's the principle of, of, of growth, it's the principle of life uh, that's being spoken of here. Uh, so in, in essence, what I think we're looking at here, like I said earlier, is a, is a symbol of the Great Mother, um, a symbol of the Great Mother. There's no um, you know, disconnect between the, the idea of the Great Mother and the idea of our sort of modern name of Mother Nature, which we call, you know, Earth and Nature and this place we inhabit. Um, but it's referring to really the idea that goes beyond that sort of invisible. Uh, it does refer to the Earth itself, but it's the sort of invisible energy or the archetypal energy which allows materiality to exist. Right. It's not just the life right? and living things, because she has dominion over yeah. minerals as well as plants and Animals, and animals process it's the the functioning aspect of, of life giving uh, whereas the life object or you know living creature would be the manifestation of that but yeah very good point it's not just the earthly things it's that which gives birth to the earthly things and i think the matrix is really such a great uh, you know uh, this because it's you know mater you know material it comes from the mother um, etymology as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, we as modern people have obviously who have watched a lot of films, think about the movie The Matrix, and maybe that's the first thing that pops into our mind when we hear the word matrix, but matrix really just means a sort of a, a foundation upon which uh, something comes, comes out of or upon which something can be built. And, and essentially, I mean, that's the symbolism of, of, of the, the matrix itself. Some uh, sort of, a, in the movie, a, a reality is sort of superimposed on, on the real reality that existed there. So at any rate, um, take a look here real quick and see uh, where I wanted to go next with this. The challenge with this, uh, with this particular section is a very short, uh, it's a very short chapter, but it's just packed with, explanations of symbolism and alchemy and hermetic symbolism and so forth. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure uh, we're, we're on track and getting into uh, uh, all the areas that I, wanted, I wanted to cover that we wanted to, to go over. Okay, so what I will do actually is I'll, I'll hand this over to you because I feel like I'm monopolizing this, but uh, 
122, where uh, Apuleius uh, does his uh, description. So Apuleius uh, wrote a book. He was a, he was a Roman who wrote a book. Who actually was a Roman who was initiated into the mysteries of Isis, and he wrote a mythological tale, which is basically his his story, but in a sort of uh, allegorical form of his journey to to finding this wisdom in the in the temple of Isis, which he eventually found. Uh, it's called the Golden Ass. Uh, and, and an excellent uh, commentary analysis of that is uh, uh, Marie Louise von Franz's analysis. She does a Jungian uh, interpretation of that, and I highly recommend it. Of uh, the Golden Ass, it's called by Apuleius, A P U L E I U S. Very, very briefly, this is the story of Isis, where she comes from, and where she's she's going, and, and just just to give give it context when we talk about the symbolism. So the story is Isis is the daughter of Geb and Nut. Geb is the earth, and that's a masculine symbol, and Nut is the sky, which is a feminine symbol, and that's very interesting because Egypt is one of the very few cultures that has that. Most cultures have that reverse. The sky god is normally male, the earth is normally female. Why the Egyptians do that, we do not know, but it's very interesting. So she is the daughter of four, there, there, there's four children of this union. Isis and Osiris, who is her brother and later becomes her husband, they become the king and queen of Egypt. And Seth and Nephthys are the other siblings, and they're sort of the dark shadow figures in this, in this quaternity, a quaternary uh, system. Um, and so basically what happens is Osiris is the king, and he is going around, he's a good king, and he's, he's going around and sharing wisdom and understanding in addition, Isis, excuse me, in addition, Osiris is recognized as the legitimate son of Ra, who is actually the father sun god, Amun Ra, Ra, one of the old gods. He's considered the, the sort of legitimate son. In some cases, in later times, he's actually uh, considered the same as or even greater than Ra himself. So it just depends on what, what period of, of Egyptian history. Remember, Egyptian history lasts a long time and these stories morph and change. So we're giving one account of one particular period of time, but this is kind of the one that, that Hermeticists and, um, and modern people look back on and use as sort of an exemplary story. So Isis and Osiris are king and queen. Uh, when Osiris is away and doing business out in the kingdom and sharing wisdom and, and solving problems, Isis is guarding the kingdom and making decisions and she's a, a just ruler as well. Uh, there becomes jealousy. Uh, between her, her sister Nephthys, Nephthys, Nephthys and Seth, uh, and of course Osiris and Isis, and Seth ends up wanting to overthrow his his uh, his brother o Osiris. So he devises this means whereby he's going to trap him. He makes this chest or a sepulcher or a coffin that's very beautiful, and then he offers it to anyone whom it can who whom can fit in, who can fit inside of it perfectly and he's built it exactly to the specifications of Osiris so he, tr he basically tricks Osiris into getting into it him and his minions seal it up cover it with lead throw it into the Nile and it floats out into an area called Biblos which is uh, which is where the the reeds were and there was a kingdom there this is actually where papyrus comes from so Isis goes out and she's mourning uh, the loss of Osiris she hears that he has been trapped and he's gone uh, she looks around all over for him, finally finds him in Biblos. Um, he has actually, uh, his, his coffin has, a tree has grown around it, and the king of Biblos has cut it down and used it as a, a pillar um, in, the, in the palace. Isis gets more or less a job as a, as a nanny with the queen of Biblos and is looking after her child, and she, she, as a, she turns into a sparrow and flies around mourning and mourning this pillar. Uh, at a certain point, she's actually doing, she's interesting, she's, she's, she's taking the son of the queen there and putting him into fire and trying to make him immortal. The queen comes in one day and sees Isis doing this and thinks she's trying to kill her child. So Isis is basically kicked out, but she makes a deal that she can take the, the um, pillar which her husband Osiris is in, and they offer it to her, give it to her. She takes it, cuts it open. Osiris is in there dead. 
Isis actually has sex with his body and conceives Horus. Uh, and then she, she leaves the, I think she leaves the body in the, she leaves the body, Seth gets a hold of the body, cuts it into 14 pieces and scatters it all over Egypt at that point. There, it, there, it goes on much longer and it's much more detailed, but that's essentially the gist of the story. There's a great amount of symbolism in all that, both um, astrological and astrotheological. Uh, that has to do with the sun and, and so on. But um, we won't, we'll not get into that right at the moment, uh, but we'll kind of jump more into uh, some of the symbolism of the actual image of Isis and what that means. I wanted to let you take that. So I just wanted to contextualize that. That's the basic story and please take over. Well, sure. That's a that's a good telling of the uh, uh, Isis Osiris myth uh, that uh, we're all familiar with in some level, but that kind of gets a little more detailed. And I like this kind of gathering all the pieces together. This kind of reintegration of uh, these broken pieces that are near and dear to our soul. And we've talked about that about depth psychology and uh, certainly a Jungian standpoint um, that these pieces need to be brought back together so we can become whole because they're all aspects of ourselves. And Osiris is also sometimes depicted as uh, you know, the lower half of his body is mummified or it's wrapped, uh, that he kind of has, literally has one foot in the grave, uh, which, which kind of puts him in the underworld uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, so here is this father god uh, who is also distant. So whether it's a sky god or an underworld god, uh, seemingly far away, and it doesn't seem to um, get past this uh, virgin layer because uh, with Isis and the Virgin Mary, you know, there's this sense of purity that, that purification um, has taken place, and it can't be defiled because it's, as you mentioned earlier, uh, although it may spend time in the material physical world, uh, that Isis and you know other deities are uh, not corruptible. They're not going to be taken in or defiled or however you want to uh, say it um, with the mortal things that that we can so become so defiled. Uh, so there's this purity uh, and alchemically it's the prima material, uh, this you know first substance that really can't be uh, corrupted in any way. Uh, but as far as the symbolism goes, now the veil is something that gets, uh, is one of the most common imagery uh, associated with Isis uh, that it can't be uh, revealed. Uh, but an interesting uh, take on the word to veil or to uh, reveal uh, actually means to reveil. <laughs> Because we know as we go through life, it's like uh, an onion layer. You peel one layer back and you go, wow, I'm glad I learned this and I've cracked this egg and I've uncovered this mystery. And now I know that, oh, wait, there's something behind it. And it uh, reminds me of a, a great quote by uh, Richard uh, Feynman, the uh, physicist. Uh, very, very interesting. You should uh, look him up or follow some quotes um, because uh, the way he talks about science and learning and wisdom and what can be known and how you can know things and some of the dangers of being, uh, oh, I know this and I'm an authority on that. Uh, but it, one of the quotes, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, he says that with every great scientific discovery comes an even deeper mystery. So uh, to reveal almost means to reveal. So you really can't get, uh, can't get through it and what's behind it is truth. And maybe we can never get to ultimate truth uh, the unknowable, uh, all that is, uh, but we can get closer to it. And what we can do is get further away from the untruths that we have uh, that are bombarding uh, us all the time uh, in this material plane. Um, but um, as far as the uh, additional symbolism, she has earrings, one is the earth, one is the moon, and she, you know, sort of this celestial aspect uh, there's a darkness to her. We're talking about Chem, the darkness of Egypt, when the uh, floodplains are inundated uh, by the, the Nile. Uh, you have this darkness, but that's what where life comes through. 
Um, speaking of speaking of that really quickly, we just interrupt real quick. Um, chem, the, the, one of the etymological sort of explanations of the word alchemy is related to that word chem. Uh, that was the ancient word chem, cheme, chema, or chemet sometimes it's known as. That's the word for ancient Egypt in the ancient Egyptian language, uh, which does mean black or land of uh, black earth or some, something along these lines. It, it, it's related to, to that imagery. Well, yeah, and the blackness is, you know, the shadow. That's what is maybe unknowable or unseen or invisible, this, the darkness of the mystery or even, you know, occult uh, things that are, you know, it's, it's occluded, it's, it's covered up. And there's this, sure. this covering and that's what we get through. Uh, I thought one of the interesting symbols um, that she holds in her hand is, uh, it's called a sistrum. It's like a noisemaker, a little more elaborate than a baby rattle. Uh, but it has like symbol or, you know, castanet sized uh, little chimes. So in the shaking of it, you, there's a rhythmic uh, because it bangs against the, the sides of this uh, like little baby tennis racket. Uh, but there's also a tone more of a kind of like a musical tone. And, um, and what's behind that, uh, the meaning of the symbolism is that the movement of life, the procession of the planets and the equinoxes and everything is ongoing. Life goes on and the earth mother knows this, you really can't stop. So this constant uh, noise making is to rouse us from uh, you know, falling asleep in the material world or becoming uh, you know, asleep in the sense that you're not aware, you're not present, you're not uh, in tune with with what's going on. And we can, we can become set in our ways or sedentary, even just emotionally or uh, psychologically. So this, and it also yeah, reminds me of the, uh, the drum that uh, Shiva has. Uh, mm -hmm. Shiva's four arms uh, is a, uh, um, I forget why, the name escapes me right now, but the, uh, the Indian, East Indian drum that has the clackers on both sides. And that's the, mm -hmm. the heartbeat, the pulse of, uh, the cosmos, you know, that it is a living, breathing thing. So uh, there's kind of an interesting there. There's a sound element because ISIS, you think, you know, the, the veiling, and that's that's uh, certainly part of it. But there's also this this sound that keeps us going. In her other hand, she um, holds essentially a scales uh, mm -hmm. balance between the moon uh, and the sun, between heaven and earth, the visible and invisible, uh, truth and not truth. Uh, weighing that out, so the uh, blind justice uh, figure that uh, the Greeks, uh, you know, later, I guess I probably derived it from. I wanted to, let me jump in real quick. That sistrum, I wanted to go back to that a little bit. I find that really interesting, too. As Manley Hall pointed out that um, it's in the, uh, the, the, the tone that it made was the, was the, uh, uh, the uh, was, is F, it's fa. Uh, I found I found that interesting. Like that's the that's a, the specific the specific you know note that it played was that was was an F, and that has to do with the harmony of the universe, I guess, or something in terms of the symbolism there. Did you did you see that where he pointed that out? I did, and that's um, that kind of leads to the next uh, really you know aspect of of Isis uh, because in the musical scale, you know, it's a do re mi fa. It's the fourth tone in this scale, and this number four comes up quite a bit with Isis, because four being uh, the material world, uh, there's even a kind of an empty picture frame that's uh, depicted uh, in one of her hands, uh, that um, you know, the four elements uh, from which you know, everything uh, emanates. So this, this number four comes up a lot. Uh, it's really encoded. Yeah. In the ice well, and then she's she's also uh, one of one of four four siblings as well, which is an interesting uh, an interesting symbolic touch. As, in, in addition, uh, well, there's like it's really rich in symbolism, and, and we could dedicate uh, you know hours to just just some of the um, you know very encoded symbols. Um, but there are uh, symbols of life, whether it's you know wheat. Uh, there's some snakes. Uh, there is the harvest, like a uh, some grapes, and since she's the, you know, earth goddess, and we're talking about the Nile bringing life to the uh, the Giza plateau and that that area all over uh, Egypt, that uh, 
growth comes out, this life. And there's an interesting combination of humidity uh, because this water element comes again. You know, water, you can think of the moon or it's more of a feminine um, symbol, uh, symbolic aspect. Uh, but it also needs the fire from the sun uh, to uh, purify it and to um, channel it into what it needs to be. Otherwise, you just kind of have this dense moisture, but uh, very much a water watering um, aspect uh, to this uh, to this symbolism. Yeah, that, I found that really interesting. And the next chapter is actually is actually all about the sun. Uh, so they they definitely. Uh, work together. The next chapter in Sacred Teachings is all about the the sun, the sun element, sun god um, archetype. Getting back to uh, that sort of uh, water symbolism, I wanted to add something to that uh, that I found in here that I found quite interesting. Um, it is this idea that oh the. Um, so you have this idea that Isis is the watery element of life, and then that combined with the sun or combined with heat is what materiality sort of sort of comes comes out of, and that's a, an alchemical idea. Uh, that is actually one of the, the symbols of that is uh, is the Star of David, which is the the two triangles, uh, one facing upward, one facing downward, um, and those two interlocking symbols uh, being fire and water, and then the union of those. Um, the other thing that's interesting about that is how Isis later becomes sort of associated with the Virgin Mary, which I talked about very, very early on. Uh, Mary, the word Mary is associated with the word mar, which is the Latin word for sea, another watery symbol. And uh, even, uh, and that connects actually, there's a connection in uh, Afro-Caribbean religion uh, between uh, the Virgin Mary and different, different aspects of her and, um, and Yoruba deities, uh, such as uh, Yemiya, who's associated with the Virgin Mary. So there's, you know, many, many cultures have this association with this great mother uh, being uh, associated or symbolizing water. Now, why is that? You know, water, there's, there's two possibilities for that. One is that water represents the unconscious, and we're talking about consciousness coming up out of this sort of chaos or undifferentiated sort of, um, you know, cosmic soup or something. And then the other one is a more sort of biological explanation of, you know, life developing, for example, out of water or out of the ocean, which is, is one of the evolutionary theories. Uh, so it could refer to one or the other, or it could refer to both of them and, and even more. And that's the beauty of symbolism. That's, you know, really just to take a quick side note. I talked about this a little bit earlier, not with you, but I, I, uh, I was thinking about this. The, I, the difference between a sign and a symbol, and Manley Hall's talked about that before, a sign is something that refers to something specific. It's a symbol, like a stop sign. It means stop in your car, you know that. It's not a symbol. A symbol is something that is, is, is open. It has open interpretation. It may have you know one or five or 10 different sort of accepted meanings, but it can't be pinned down. It's bigger than a sign, and it's and it's open to to interpretation, and it refers to something that's mysterious. That's the thing we have to remember about the difference between a sign and a symbol. And this is where people get caught up in thinking, I'm gonna crack the code like the Da Vinci Code, and I'm gonna figure out what this symbol means. And while you can find out what symbols meant at different times and in different places, you will never exhaust that symbol's meaning. And that's one of the the sort of underlying things in Jung's idea about an archetype. It's yes. something visible and very powerful and something that you cannot really pin down. And that's why a lot of people have trouble with, with Jungian psychology because it, it can be very ambiguous. Um, but that's the nature of the mysteries. They are ambiguous. ambiguous You've got to work them out yourself. It is universal, you know, that it was yes. time or this culture or this region uh, it's, it, you're right. It, I mean, it's very much an archetypal symbol. You know, symbols are archetypal that, uh, they, they can't, they can't, yeah, you said they can't be pinned down, uh, but they, they're eternal and they're internal 
and it's up to us to unpack the the symbolism uh, and really what it what it means. And you know, in talking about this this water thing again, and what what ISIS uh, also represents is the balance. So we have the scales, uh, but it's balancing between the water and uh, the heat or the sun or the light, the darkness and the light. And we even see this in this uh, image from the secret teachings. ISIS yeah. is on each side by two. I'm going to hold that up. I'm okay. going to hold that up I, real quick. Sure. So there is that that image right there, and or you can you know maybe cut it in later. But go okay. ahead. So she's flanked by those those pillars. Yeah, and that could be uh, relating to um, the two pillars of, of masonry. Uh, you know, there's a dark and a light one. Um, Boaz and Joaquin. Walk, Joaquin. Joaquin, okay. Yeah. Um, so, and then she stands in the middle. Uh, so with the scales, with the pillars, uh, with the sun and the moon, uh, she's more than just, you know, the earth, like a static thing. Um, it's really this, what comes out of this, this harmony uh, between these dynamic opposites. So you can also think of uh, yin and yang, uh, that uh, in, in that, <laughs> using that model, um, she would be the, the harmony between the two, the Tao, perhaps, uh, not just the, you know, dark yin, you know, feminine. Mm -hmm. um, she really uh, encapsulates uh, both of them, weighs them, and balances them and have harmony in, in, uh, in the symbol. Yeah, I think, I, and I think that's why it's, it's a great point. And, they, and placing her between those two pillars shows that e equilibrating effect that she has. She is neither one uh, nor the other, though she has a, a feminine s symbolism main, mainly, she's, she's really beyond, beyond the masculine or beyond the feminine and those two forces interacting and, and she becomes something quite different as, a, as the equal, equilibrating force between the two of them. And, and when you look at that, I mean, you, you see the, you know, the interplay of, of, um, of those positive and negative energies, uh, that's what allows materiality to exist. And of course then, you know, she is that, she is that force She's the force behind this this material world, and and looking at it that way, then it becomes something really quite quite mysterious. Um, and I, I love that pillar symbolism. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. It it's, it also reminds reminds one of uh, of the uh, the pillars on uh, the uh, the tree of life, uh, the Kabbalistic uh, tree of life. She she would she would be the middle pillar. There's a there's a pillar on the right and a pillar. On the left, I mean, and and then there's a middle pillar, and and one is, you know, there's a severity, and then there's a pillar of my, uh, uh, pillar of uh, mercy, and then the middle is a is a is the sort of equilibrium, the pillar of mildness, and it's the sort of equilibrating force, equ equ equilibrating. Am I saying that correctly? Equilibrating. I guess. Sounds good. <laughs> sure, why, <laughs> sure. Sure. Why not? You see, this is what happens when you go to public school. You know, and though I do do have a graduate degree, the public school is, is still deep in there. So uh, at any rate, she is the force between those two forces that allows uh, materiality to exist. And I find that quite interesting. Okay, so let us go to the last portion of this that I wanted to talk about. And this is kind of a free form one because we actually didn't even talk about this before the show. So the great mother archetype, the, the sort of mother nature, the, the fount of, of life, uh, symbolism, motherhood, nurturing, life, generativity, and so on are all sort of wrapped up in this Isis symbolism, this Virgin Mary symbolism, uh, you know, sort of pagan nature goddesses, Ceres, and so forth, uh, are all wrapped up in the same kind of symbolism. But here's an, another interesting, so the flip side of this would be Isis's sister, Nephthys, or um, let's look at some, like what would be known as the, uh, the devouring mother, the dark, the dark mother, uh, symbolized in in uh, mythology by Kali. Uh, there's other dark, dark mother figures, devouring mothers, destroyers, um, and this is an archetype that's interesting um, because it really, like I said, it's the it's the flip side of this. It's destructive, um, but it's the you know it's the counterbalance to to life. I mean, death goes hand in hand with life, obviously. 
Uh, in, interestingly enough, though, in psychology, this, this devouring mother uh, symbolism is associated with things like an Oedipal complex, uh, mother complexes, and so on, if you know anything about those, whereby uh, the male or female son or daughter of a mother that's overbearing cannot uh, pull away uh, from that mothering sort of influence. And that's where the sort of the, 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 the I'm going to say this, the dark, the dark side of it comes out when, when, and when consciousness isn't allowed to develop out of that, the individuation process cannot unfold with that, that kind of smothering, mothering energy. Uh, mostly it manifests in men, but the, the dark mother can also manifest in females in different ways as well. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about that at the devouring mother archetype, yes? Yes, well, even the, uh, the creatures of nature, um, it's a kind of a brutal planet that we live on. I mean, we kind of have to kill each other in order to survive, or at least we have to kill plants and animals as far as humans. Animals you know, are always either killing each other or trying to evade capture and consumption. Uh, it is just the cycle of life. It just happens to be how this earth plane and the world we live in uh, is uh, created or how it evolved. And uh, But it's it's an undeniable and you can't really separate it out. You can't just put on, you know, half a blinder and, and look at the, oh, it's the creator and nurturer and giving birth to all living things. And it's wonderful. It really, there is that, uh, that other side, the two sides to it. So it's the destruction is really transformation. And I think that's what this is really getting at this dynamic. So you have the system making this noise and it's, it's constantly moving. It moves forward. Uh, new life springs forth. It grows and matures uh, and regenerates uh, that it's, um, you know, this generative aspect. And then there's this dying and then recycling or rebirth or reincarnation, or even if it's just the next generation, mm -hmm. a tree that goes dormant uh, in the uh, fall and in the winter, uh, then springs forth again. Now there's new buds, new life, new uh, leaves and, and fruit uh, that come forth. So it's really transformation um, of all things. And also, like we were talking about, you know, moisture and heat, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sun and moon, heaven and earth, uh, visible, invisible, this balance, yeah. harmonizing factor. Uh, it's also the life and death uh, that, you know, in a way she holds both. In both so in that darker in that darker aspect, uh, kind of getting back to that psychological part of it, I think those maybe some of those uh, death aspects from death and resurrection and the death and rebirth uh, sort of symbolism. But then you have this sort of d the devouring mother as well, which is something that um, we see, as I said, psychologically speaking, it might be connected to uh, something like um, witch figures, uh, like for example, in Hansel and Gretel, the witch that's inside of the uh, the gingerbread house, um, or, or or some of these kinds of figures, the the the, the wicked queens uh, in the fairy tales, uh, wicked stepmothers in fairy tales, and things like that. And those are uh, some of the darker, more sort of uh, non-constructive uh, dark sides of the of the mother, we'd say. And psychologically, then they kind of um, play themselves out in our lives. Us, holding us back because that nurturing is fantastic. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, but at some point, the mother aspect, the nurturing aspect has to kick the, the baby bird out of the nest or it'll never learn to fly. And so that's where that dark mother, or that devouring mother comes in. And in our own lives, you know, we can see it with some of these, this overprotecting, overprotective parenting and so on that goes on today, where kids are not allowed to go out and, and make the mistakes uh, that they need to make, rough house, play, learn the limits of things, and so on. Uh, but they become smothered by this devouring mother energy that while it, it, its its intentions are good, it plays out in a super negative way that actually inhibits growth. It inhibits the growth, thus the devouring uh, of the children. And that's, that's, an, that's, an, that's another that's another dark and kind of interesting aspect of it. It's something to look out. That's the, the flip side of the positive sort of uh, motif of death and rebirth or the, the, the converse of that, the life giving and generative qualities of the great mother. Uh, this would be the psychological devouring mother. And that's uh, 
that's a that's a one of the dark aspects psychologically as far as human beings go. I even like know. a mother complex where you you know, become so attached uh, to the the mother, whether it's you know the physical you know human <laughs> mother or if it's the collective or anything that has that uh, that mother or um, you know, if you're so connected with your school or uh, anything that kind of gives you a platform uh, to, to the point, uh, to a fault, to where you're not uh, growing as an individual. You know, it can be very uh, safe, I guess, if you stay either at home or whether it's your job or uh, even in academia, people can, can really disappear uh, and sure. never really become who they are because they're sort of lost in and this this you know complex um, of what you know maybe does provide nurture and uh, sustain uh, sustainability, uh, but if if that is so dependent, uh, if we're so dependent upon that, um, then they're just you're just always looking for you know feed me, uh, you know feed the baby bird, ah, you know. Yeah. And get, uh, or, getting back to the 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 pillars that you were talking about. ICE is sitting between those two pillars. If you look at one of the pillars as being sort of like nurturing on one side and then it's sort of uh, severe, I want to say severity, but more of like correction on the other side. They, they're sort of um, setting boundaries and limits and so on on the other. And then she kind of sits between the two. She's the equilibrium between those, between those two. Um, but you're right. I mean, I, I said I like that baby bird analogy. It's like, yeah, you're sitting there with your mouth open, feed me, feed me, feed me. And there's no... A mother bird to do that, then you you know you're going to starve. So you got to learn how to get out of that nest and and fend for yourself, right? Right, right. And you know, just again, we're talking about symbolism. Even if we talk about something that's very gender oriented, um, you know, these these are aspects. These are uh, traits and archetypes, and they can exist you know, whether it's a you know a boy or a girl or or anything like that. I mean, it really transcends uh, that. So we're not really getting into a, a binary gender thing. Uh, well, but I mean, biologically speaking, though, and this is where we get into a lot of these gender issues, is that there there is biology, and there's hundreds of thousands of years of evolutionary development into male and female. And we can ask questions of that, and we can ask questions of what does it mean to be a patriarchal society or a matriarchal society, but the, some of these things are rooted in, in biological and evolutionary uh, structures within, within the genetic coding in this as well. I mean, we can't forget that. Oh, uh, no, in, yeah. You know what I mean? In the larger discussion, and I'm not trying to... Yeah. ...to, to, to dismantle the, uh, those, those gender questions, uh, but it is important to also look at some of how, how these archetypal images uh, connect to those, those, those biological and kind of the historical trajectory of society as well, right? So, Sure. Well, it's how the things got named in the first place because, you know, how we, at least as ancients and primitives, you know, that's how we learned uh, was through looking at each other, ourselves, uh, the world around us, nature, what nature was doing. And we were very clear I mean, just look at, we're talking about birds, just look at birds. I mean, the difference between a female and a male bird is pretty dramatic. Uh, you can really see this. So yes, definitely differences. And yes, they are grounded in biological uh, genders. Um, but, as, but as we're working with symbols, um, they can also go beyond that as we exactly. are limited by that. Exactly, great point. And that's, I just wanted to add that little, little bit in there that, you know, like we said, you cannot... Uh, put clear boundaries around around symbolism and and though the ancients you know use some of these physical representations to to model certain ideas they, they go well beyond that as well all right with that actually i think uh we should probably wrap it up because i noticed we're, we're about 10 or 11 minutes into this and we've got probably 40 minutes in the other one um i do want to thank everybody for joining us today uh, we are going to get more into this this symbolism uh, we, we covered today Isis, um, and we looked at Manley Hall's chapter, uh, it's chapter eight of the Secret Teachings, Isis, uh, the Virgin of the World. Fantastic uh, a read. Please read it when you get a chance. Uh, do support us uh, if you can, anchor.fm slash Cosmic Eye, and you can, uh, we could really use your financial support. Uh, but also uh, follow us if you're on iTunes or whatever service you're using to listen to us uh, on the podcast. 
follow us there and, and, and like us. And, and if you get a chance, uh, do check out uh, uh, do check out the video. We'll, we'll have a link up to that if we can uh, work out our technical difficulties that we uh, that we experienced today. But we did get a podcast out of it at least, and we know we know that ISIS was looking over us, uh, being generative with that. So we do have the podcast to fall back on. But hopefully, we'll be able to put up a video as well, and we'll put a link to that if we're able to do that. Uh, thank you, Chris, for your insightful information today. And uh, thank you for every, everybody for joining us. We're here every Sunday, and we appreciate you uh, listening. Uh, goodbye. Have a great weekend. God bless.